What is the lust of the flesh? 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. The Bible itemizes the kind of lust that exists in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye. Today, our focus is on the lust of the flesh. Lust is an unruly desire or excessive craving for something. Simply put, the lust of the flesh is our excessive fleshly desires and cravings which allures us to sin. Lust intoxicates. It pushes its victims to behave foolishly. The lust of the flesh developed from the fallen nature of man. Initially, the human spirit interacts directly with the Holy Spirit and communicates to the soul while the soul dictates to the flesh. But as soon as man sinned against God, his flesh rebelled against the spirit. And since that time, the flesh has developed its own voice and appetite. God will help us to discover the operation of the lust of the flesh and how we can overcome it. The lust of the flesh is what makes it hard for several believers to fast. The flesh always wants what is pleasurable to it. It will fight anything that tends to bring discomfort of any kind. Each time you want to fast, your body will tell you that you are going to lose shape. Meanwhile, fasting is a spiritual exercise that makes you susceptible to the Spirit of God. The lust of the flesh is what is responsible for uncontrolled appetite for food. If you allow your appetite to rule you, it will lead you to descend very low. There were people who were looking for Jesus during his earthly ministry. Ordinarily, you wouldn't think that they have such a great passion for the Word of God. But when Jesus saw their motives, he knew that they sought for him because he provided them with bread and fish a day before. John 6, 26 through 27. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. They were seeking for Christ not because they loved him, but for the sake of their bellies. A person with uncontrolled appetite can eat anything, anywhere. Food becomes the idol they treasure in their hearts. But Jesus didn't allow his fleshly desire for food to stop him from doing the work that God sent him. John 4.13-14 Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The lust of the flesh makes you live a life that is dominated by your senses. It makes you base your living on what you see, hear, and feel rather than by faith. The Bible says that we do not work by sight, but by faith. But your flesh will make your senses to rule you if you do not subject it to discipline. In John 15, 4-5, Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. We are like the branches of a tree, Jesus Christ being the trunk. A branch cannot bear fruit if it is not grafted into the stem. If we choose to separate ourselves from God, we will become hopeless and helpless. But if we abide in Christ and make him our sufficiency, we will never struggle to be fruitful because all nutrients needed for survival and fruit bearing will be supplied by the root and stem. More so, God is not glorified in us until we are productive. 
The world cannot bear godly fruit because it is living in isolation from God. That is why God cannot be glorified in it. If we ever want the name of the Lord to be glorified in us, then we must abide in Him and become totally dependent on the strength He supplies. Again, the lust of the flesh is responsible for uncontrolled sexual immorality of this generation. Sexual immorality of all sorts have been greatly sponsored by the devil against the human race to ensure that we sin against God and fall short of his glory. Those who are given to fornication and adultery are victims of the lust of the flesh. They do not have control over their sexual urges. The lust of the flesh is what every believer must fight against. Otherwise, it will deal a great loss to us. Lust has both physical and spiritual consequences. In fact, there's nothing good about it, consequences. Apostle Paul told us how we can overcome the lust of the flesh in Galatians 5, 16 through 17, when he said, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. If we would overcome the desires of the flesh, then we must walk in the Spirit. That is, we must not allow the flesh to dictate how we should live. Rather, we must be willing to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit every time. Walking by the Spirit is living a life that is controlled by the guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit. It is contrary to walking by the flesh that is using our own strength and knowledge. Walking by the Spirit is having a continuous fellowship with the Holy Spirit. This is done through reading the Word of God and prayer. When Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica, he advised them not to quench the power of the Holy Spirit, as he knew the importance of the guidance of the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 do not quench the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will only speak to us as we are in the Spirit. When our Spirit and the Holy Spirit in us are in agreement and fellowship, the outcome becomes evident. Ephesians 5, 18 through 19. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. A natural man that has no fellowship with the Holy Spirit cannot receive the things of the Spirit, including hearing from the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14 But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. There are things that God has prepared for those who love him, things that no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor entered the heart of a man, but now he reveals to us through the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.10 But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Therefore, those who walk by the Spirit have the privilege to receive the things of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.12 Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Engaging in spiritual activities is another important medium of putting the body under check. As believers, we must not give pleasure to our body all the time. We must learn to fast, to keep vigils, and to discipline ourselves in the area of food. You can get lost if you do not deal with lust. Romans 8.5, New King James Version For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. Life in the Spirit is a journey, and while many great passages throughout Scripture discuss the role and person of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 is perhaps one of the most insightful. Sometimes the Holy Spirit leads us directly. The Holy Spirit can choose to act in any way, and according to any timetable that he wishes, we do not dictate to him how or when he will move. Since the Bible gives many examples of him acting more specifically, we should anticipate that he will sometimes choose to lead us directly if we are open and available to his guidance. 
But how can we live a life directed by the Holy Spirit and fuel a passion for the things of the Spirit? We find steps in Romans 8, 5. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. The question, how does one overcome the pull of the flesh, sounds like an old riddle. How can someone extract all of the air out of a drinking glass? The most direct way to get all of the air out of a glass is by filling it with something else. You cannot extract thoughts that displease God from your mind. Like the solution to the riddle, you need to be filled up with thoughts. Indeed, with an entire mindset that is oriented toward the things of the Spirit. This is why Romans 12, 2 tells us, And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, the will of God. Step one is to fill your mind with God's thoughts. Fill your mind with things of the Spirit. The Bible is a spiritual book, and the words in this book are spiritual food that we can fill our minds and live by. Matthew 4.4 4, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, the Bible is a spiritual book, and without the Holy Spirit, you will never be able to understand the Bible. The Bible has nothing to do with your intellect. It's to do with your spirit, the inner man. This is why without the Holy Spirit you can read the Bible and it won't have the same effect as someone with the Holy Spirit who reads the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, now for you and me to renew our mind, we need to know the word of God. For you to become a complete man or woman of God, you need to know the word of God. There is no substitute, absolutely no substitute for the word of God. The Bible is our reference point. It's the anchor to our soul. The more and more you read the word of God and receive it, the process of renewal of your mind begins. 